As, as NAP4 study from Britain showed us, uh, anesthesiologists often avoid doing awake intubation, even in cases where awake intubation is indicated. And they, they don't do awake intubation primarily because they lack their own confidence in their skills. What I find is that people tend to concentrate on only doing airway blocks when they're about to do an awake intubation. And that there's actually five different things that you have to concentrate on besides the awake blocks. The first one is explanation, telling your patient why you're doing the awake intubation and gaining their confidence. The second thing is uh, giving them a desiccant, making sure that the airway is dry so that when you apply your blocks, especially topically, they work. And secondly, when you use your optical instruments, you don't have the problems of saliva in the airway. The third is to always prepare the nasal cavity unless contraindicated. You don't know when you'll need to go through the nasal cavity if, if for some reason oral intubation fails. And also by preparing the nasal cavity, you do get some effect of block within the oral cavity and the hypopharynx, the um, uh, larynx eventually. Um, the next, of course, is your topical blocks. And people get very confused about what kind of blocks to use. I divide the airway into three parts, the nasal portion, the oral pharyngeal portion, and the hypopharyngeal portion. And I do a non-invasive topical block to each. And they can be very simple. For the nasal portion, I'm applying 2% to 5% local anesthetic with uh, swabs or a syringe into the airway. For the oral pharyngeal portion, I'm putting local anesthetic against the palatoglossal arches where I can anesthetize the glossopharyngeal nerve. And lastly, for the, the rest of the airway, I'm allowing lidocaine, usually 2% lidocaine, to drip onto the back of the tongue and to allow the patient to aspirate it, to cough a little bit is okay, and get good analgesia of the airway. Next comes sedation. Sedation really can be any agent that you feel comfortable with. Uh, this can be benzodiazepines, it can be dexmedetomidine, it could be uh, opioids, rapid opioids, or longer acting opioids. But the key is to use titration. Don't give boluses of drugs. Use careful titration. You don't want your patient to become apneic. And also try to avoid polypharmacy. Stick to one or two agents. Try to avoid getting into multiple agents where you may get into side effects and complications. And lastly, the last part of the, the sequence or the, the method for doing awake intubation is to manage your time. There's a lot of time pressure in the operating room and what I find is that if you can start before the patient gets into the operating room with your explanation, giving the patient a desiccant, starting to prepare the nasal cavity and maybe doing the topical blocks, by the time you get to the operating room, you'll be prepared for your awake intubation. Um, I think the most important take-home message is that historically we have focused on pre-oxygenation and then a rush to put the tube in and then after the tube goes in we bag the patients back up and that historically we haven't done oxygenation during the intubation effort and simply taking nasal cannula, uh, attaching it to a separate oxygen source, but taking nasal cannula in the wide awake patient at four to six liters a minute, or in the obtunded patient, up to 15 liters a minute, adding that underneath your face mask as you pre-oxygenate, and then when you do direct or video laryngoscopy, leaving the nasal cannula on, and I crank it up to 15 after they've gone off to sleep, that that will dramatically improve the safe apnea time. And uh, that happens because of differences in gas diffusion from CO2 and oxygen. So CO2 leaks out very slowly, and oxygen can absorb much better than CO2 leaks out. So as long as you put high FiO2 in the upper airway, it will be drawn down en masse down the trachea and prevent desaturation. So my experience in the last year and a half using this technique is that patients, even in emergency situations, initially hypoxic, uh, do not desaturate. Key parts to this are a patent upper airway, so sometimes you need nasal trumpets. You also want the head higher than the stomach uh, the lungs work better, and you also decrease the risk of regurgitation. But simple addition of a nasal cannula can dramatically improve safe apnea in emergency airways.